Okay, now we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome to our talk. Um, this is the introduction to the OWASP API Security Project, um, which is a project that Leaf and I have been working on for probably about the last uh, eight months or so. We're really happy to finally be unveiling that and uh, hopefully uh, getting some of you people involved uh, should be pretty good. Uh, this talk is a little bit different than uh, some of the other talks at this conference and some of the other talks that Leaf and I have given in the past. We'll display some of the research that we've done, um, but really what we did as our research for this project um, is what we consider somewhat preliminary. Uh, we basically took the data that we could find and the statistics that we could find um, and compiled that into what we think is a pretty good first step uh, for this project. But really, more than anything else, this is a call for participation. Um, we're not uh, saying that this is done and perfect, um, but we'd like to get the project some exposure and hopefully uh, pique some of your guys' interest. Um, so the agenda for today is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to do the general introduction stuff. You know, who are we? Uh, what's OWASP? Uh, you know, why are we even doing this project in the first place? Um, we'll give some uh, real-world examples, both that we've seen in the media and that uh, Leaf has seen through uh, working for BugCrowd, uh, which gives him some nice visibility there. Um, we'll go through the uh, top 10 API security risks, or at least what we have of those uh, so far. Um, and then we'll talk about sort of how you can help, how you can join the project, how you can uh, be involved in one way or another. Uh, so to start off, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I don't think I know too many people here. Uh, my name is David Shaw. Uh, I'm on Twitter at dshaw underscore. The other guy is not me. Uh, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at a software company called Appfolio, based in Santa Barbara, California. It was a pretty rough travel to get here. We got here like early this morning after several canceled flights. Um, I was the former CTO at Redspin, which is an application security consultancy, until it was acquired last year. Um, I've presented at NOLACON twice before on uh, more in-depth technical security research. Um, again, that's not really the point of this talk today. Um, and I will drink with you uh, either with our selection of booze here or hopefully the bar's open, at which point we can just go do that. I'm happy to talk about these ideas or just security in general with anyone at any time uh, or not with a drink. If you don't drink, that's fine. Uh, but I'll be here throughout the weekend, so hopefully you can meet some of you guys and, uh, and have some good conversations. I'm Leif Dreisler. I have a, a much more unique Twitter handle, uh, considering that there's only one Leif Dreisler. Uh, I'm a security engineer for BugCrowd, and I used to work with David at Redspin. Um, I've given conference presentations at a couple different B-sides and, and things like that, and uh, I'm the Indiana Jones of memes, so hopefully you find some enjoyment from those. Yeah, as a... As a side note, I mentioned our flight was canceled. So I got in this morning, really tired, about 90 minutes of sleep. And I, and I find Leaf, and I'm like, all right, are we good to give this talk? And he's like, yeah, I made a lot of cool additions for you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what do you, what do you mean, man? Like, I thought we finalized it. Like, we had the slide deck. Everything was good. He's like, well, I thought it'd be a good idea to just add it. I mean, add in some memes and images. I'm like, all right. So you we put spent. Meme archaeologists. I wasn't going to yeah, have it be devoid we of spent, memes. We spent probably. 45 minutes going through and removing memes from the talk after <laughs> it's not it's not a joke <laughs> uh, <laughs> so how many of you uh, just so I can get sort of like a quick survey how many people are familiar with a wasp okay cool so that's most people probably like half two-thirds uh, that's good um, a wasp so, <laughs> uh, OWASP, for those that don't know, is the Open Web Application Security Project, which is just a nice acronym. It sounds cool. Um, basically, that's a huge repository um, of information on the OWASP.org wiki. Um, if you've never been there and you work in security, I strongly recommend it. A lot of cheat sheets, documentation, things like that. Um, They've released some tools that aren't bad. Uh, Zap, the Z Attack Proxy, is basically a, a free and open source intercepting proxy. Uh, they have some tools that are bad, but we won't talk about that. Uh, probably not good for the talk. Um, and they also uh, organize some pretty high-profile conferences. The, the most high-profile of those probably being AppSec USA every year. Um, also, they have AppSec EU. Uh, Leaf and I are staff at AppSec California. Um, so, you know, they're a pretty reputable organization. Um, they really try to give back to the community, which is why we're trying to participate with them to sort of, uh, you know, move move things forward. Um, 
so in addition to their tools and their projects and the conferences, um, OWASP also has documentation projects, and some of these are actually pretty famous, right? Um, so the top 10 guides are pretty much, if you're like, hey, like, what are some web security vulnerabilities? It's going to come up. A bunch of pen testing firms use, uh, like, the OWASP web application top 10 as, like, security categories or finding categories. It's very common. Uh, you can't really avoid it. Um, but they also have, you know, like the mobile security top 10, um, the Internet of Things top 10 security risks. That's sort of like their flagship documents that people use. It gets OWASP exposure, and, uh, you know, they're big fans of that. Um, so the OWASP API security project sort of is seeking to document um, the pitfalls and mitigations of those pitfalls uh, in deploying APIs uh, and and also assessing those APIs. If you try to say, hey, I'm a pen tester, I'm trying to assess API security, you'll probably notice there isn't really that much uh, documentation, probably because in general it's harder than assessing a web application. Um, so we're trying to also seek to address sort of that shortage there. Um, but after I just told you all of this documentation that's on the OWASP wiki and how great it is and woohoo, like, go OWASP, you know, you might be wondering, you know, okay, well, why do you actually even need to create, uh, you know, this document, this project? Um, well, API security is really important. It, it's growing in importance pretty much every month. The rate at which companies are deploying APIs is, is increasing very rapidly. And there's sort of a couple reasons for that, right? So public APIs, meaning uh, a user or a client can connect and do things via a public API, um, very widespread, but also internal APIs and microservices are continuing to sort of grow in, in adoption all the time. Uh, so at the company where I work, um, you know, we sort of have one monolithic Rails app. That's the primary flagship product. But when we add on to that, or if we add tertiary services to that, um, those are deployed as microservices. And we just write APIs. Uh, we can have both the application or other applications query each other and basically make things work fast in an easily deployed way. It's very useful. Uh, you also have sort of the challenge of platform-based issues, right? So if you're, hey, I'm um, hot new startup, uh, bug cloud, and you decide that you want to just uh, have your application work on the Facebook platform, well, you're basically only interacting via APIs, right? I mean, without the APIs of Facebook, without the platform on which you're basing your application, uh, nothing would work. So just a couple examples that have, have come out recently. Um, the first one is recently Microsoft uh, put out a blog post stating that they're working on a REST API that would allow you to configure and manage IIS. Uh, the goal of this is to make IIS configurable from any device that knows how to make a web call, um, specifically mobile applications. Um, so you know, configuring something as important as your web server uh, from an API, there's a lot of security concerns that would be in place with having something like that be more open. Um, another example is in March of this year, Uber released a blog post detailing the specifics of their bug bounty program, including documentation of APIs. Um, these APIs can do things like find nearby drivers, split fares with friends, or allow people to build applications that interact with Uber. So there's a lot of functionality that APIs um, contain and some of it can be very sensitive. Imagine if you could, uh, you know, share a ride to the airport or back from the airport to NOLACON and I could um, make it so that I'm paying significantly less fare uh, than David. Thanks. Not that I would do that. I, I, would, be I, I believe. Yeah. I would expense it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make this bigger. Yeah. I guess I'm not going to make it bigger. Um, okay. Um, so web applications, as I'm sure most people here know, if they're in sort of the security community, have pretty major security problems, right? I mean, we hear about, you know, major breaches through web applications pretty much all the time. SQL injection, uh, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, et cetera, right? Um, but with the exception of, you know, sort of like weird side channel attacks, there's not really that many new techniques for breaking these web applications, right? I mean, yeah, there might be particularly cool instances of, hey, we found this really cool SQL injection or XXE or whatever, uh, or even, hey, you know, we found this minor cross-site scripting bug and we were able to hook in beef and, you know, take over an organization. That's great. Um, but, you know, in general, these vulnerability types are, are solved. Um, and I put the asterisk here because obviously people are still getting breached that way, um, but the actual vulnerability type, we know how to tell a developer not to write SQL injection in their code, not to write cross-site scripting in their code. It's a solved vulnerability type. Um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, you can just mitigate these things, right? So uh, that said, many APIs, especially ones that are being sort of written as maybe an afterthought of more flagship products from major organizations, um, are sort of like, okay, well, a different team is going to write this, and it's going to be done much later, and they're not going to have necessarily the same protection. So for example, um, Instagram right now is a fully functional, uh, basically, we won't say it's completely secure, but fine, fairly hardened application. Um, that basically, if you add in an external API to post photos or to do all these different tasks, uh, you can basically add in security holes. If you're not doing the exact same permissions check that you might be doing um, via the actual application, then you're going to introduce holes where what you think you're doing is just making something easier to use or opening up your platform uh, for further use. Uh, so a good example of this is that um, last year, United Airlines launched a bug bounty program. Uh, maybe the successful thing that they fly right now. Um, so <laughs> I'm a little bitter from yesterday. So uh, basically one of the most critical vulnerabilities that was released um, through this um, is basically by using the mobile app, um, you can see uh, API requests because they spun up an API to support the mobile app. Um, now that's invisible to the user. So users aren't actually saying, oh, I have an API key. I'm going to go through. I'm going to do all this stuff. Um, it's really just, oh, well, if I open up, you know, an intercepting proxy or I take a packet capture or whatever, you can see the actual uh, API requests uh, on the wire. Um, so basically what happened in this particular instance, and I'm not going to go through the full case study, but basically in this particular instance, if you had someone's mileage plus number, which you could, it's not really considered super sensitive, you put it in hotel bookings, things like that, you get what's called um, a record locator. Um, and using this record locator, you can make a series of requests that would basically un unveil uh, flight plans, allow you to change flight plans, would reveal last fourth credit card, um, would basically do all these things that not only does it, <laughs> it's an awesome... <laughs> No, man. No, please don't be. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> um, but basically, you could go through, and with this record locator, you could change flights. You could add yourself to flights. You could change names. You could take someone's, well, at least I'll ask for their credit card number. And it's really bad, right? That was super critical. Um, so major organizations are basically accidentally exposing sensitive data um, and methods via API access. They're not Clearly, they're not meaning to do it, but they're saying, oh, you know, everyone's releasing these APIs. We should do that, too. Or even we have a legitimate use case to do so, um, but we're not putting the same security controls or even thought into the dev process um, that would be done for the actual formal, formal applications. Um, uh, okay. So, oh yeah, roughly a, a quarter of the bounties that, that people have seen on BugCrowd and HackerOne um, sort of include the API in their scope. And that's only things, I believe, that were specifically called out. Um, so like the United Airlines thing isn't saying, hey, we have a specific API that we'd like you to test, but they had a mobile app that was in scope, which made API calls on the back end. Also, we're working off of very tiny thumbnails of slides in case like you're wondering. The... Yeah, I, I, yeah, this is awful. Yeah. It's, yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. We did something. Uh, that was probably a poor choice. Then. There we go. Is it up? Is that displaying slides? Yeah. I, it should I'm be right. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. No, it's mirrored. Yeah. We're All right. good. All right. So <laughs> I'm technical. Um, <laughs> so we're going to go over some API security examples. Um, one of the, re the recent Magento security bulletins, uh, they do fairly detailed patch notes. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Magento, they help companies run e-commerce platforms. A ton of companies use them. They're part of the eBay family of companies. In their most recent security bulletin, 50%, uh, so three of six of the vulnerabilities that were fixed were API-related vulnerabilities. There was one critical, that was uh, remote code execution. There was one high, which had to do with account hijacking. And there was a medium, which had to do uh, with being able to manipulate items in a, a guest cart. So if you have a, you know, you haven't logged in yet, you're working on a, on a cart, somebody else could make manipulations to your cart. Um, another couple examples that were in the news recently, um, there was one from Qualcomm that was uh, now that I don't have the notes up, it's a uh, gingerbread <laughs> through lollipop, I think. Um, so not the most recent version of Android. 
Um, but just to give you guys an idea, the versions that are affected cover about 92% of Android devices. Um, obviously not all of those have Qualcomm chipsets, so not 90% of Android devices were vulnerable, but still a huge percentage. And the vulnerability, um, I forget what the API name was, but it was pretty low level, obviously, if it's a vulnerability in Qualcomm. Uh, they make the radio chipsets for a lot of cell phones. It allows you to read text messages, uh, view the, the call logs, and also perform radio actions from the device. So radio actions are basically um, all of the stuff that you barely use your phone for anymore. So not the apps, um, not browsing the, the web, but um, some of the more basic things like sending text messages and calling people. Um, another one was the Instagram bug that caught a lot of uh, news outlets due to the age of the reporter. Um, a 10-year-old kid found a bug in Instagram that allowed you to uh, delete comments from other users and got rewarded $10,000. So that was in a, an internal API uh, within the, the Instagram code that um, had that vulnerability. Another couple ones that are, that are interesting and fun to look up after this, uh, the first one was a um, manipulation of a Tesla API. So whether or not you release the API to people, if it's in something that they can access, they're going to poke around. They're going to either look at your source code um, if they can. If not, they're going to look at the requests on the wire. So both of these stories come from people basically looking at the web calls from the mobile clients that Snapchat and Tesla have. And I don't know if you guys saw the video, but somebody used Alexa from Amazon Echo to be able to open up their garage door, turn on the Tesla, and pull their car out of the garage, similar to Knight Rider. So that one was kind of, <laughs> that one was kind of fun. Um, Snapchat one, uh, speaking of AppSec California, if you ever want to come out to California during January, we basically don't have winter if you've never been out there. So if you're from an area that has winter, uh, it can be pretty, pretty fun to, to come out. Anyway, uh, the director of InfoSec at Snapchat this year gave, uh, I thought it was a really good presentation about all the issues that they have with people um, manipulating the APIs and using them for functionality that they weren't designed for. So Snapchat doesn't release uh, a public API for their program, but what people will do is they'll piece together um, different versions of API calls, maybe from an older version in Android, a newer version of iOS, something else in the middle, um, I don't know if there's a version for Windows Phone, but you might pull something from there too. And basically what people will do is they'll come up with these third-party additions to Snapchat that will allow for uh, new functionality. So maybe you can save messages without notifying the person that sent it to you or things like that. And this is a major problem for them because they can't just shut down these older versions of the APIs because they risk locking out people that are using older versions of Snapchat. Obviously, you know, the more users that they have, the more money that they're making. So it's very difficult for them to monitor the functionality of these older APIs and things that shouldn't be happening and allowing um, people's accounts to get compromised. I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2014, um, there was a major hack against Snapchat. Um, Snapchat said that it was actually third-party services that people had been logging into with their Snapchat credentials. The way that those third-party services work are... Um, based off of manipulating the API and using it for things that it wasn't intended for. So David mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, APIs are often neglected during testing. Uh, usually APIs are harder and less fun to test. Um, I know that when I was doing pen testing, I mean, what would you rather look at? Some web app that you don't know what the heck it's doing, but you can still find fun things to break in it? or just a bunch of sample API calls where you have to do a bunch of work to fill in parameters. Um, you know, you're not getting the same error messaging that you're frequently getting from the web application. Um, just generally not as fun, in my opinion, to mess around with just the text. It's more fun to, to break stuff that you can see. In addition, depending on how robust the API is, maybe it's more of like an SDK, you might actually have to build something, um, which not all web pen testers are comfortable doing, especially um, you know if you don't really have as strong of a development background. And even if you do, it's still just way more time consuming than just clicking through somebody's web application, burps doing some stuff in the background, you're looking for some stuff on your own. Um, with the APIs, you're gonna have to copy and paste a bunch of stuff into whatever intercepting proxy you're using. So um, some of the standard tools that people rely on aren't built uh, with APIs in mind for testing.
we didn't really know where to fit this meme, but I just typed in Spider-Man security meme and this came up, so I felt like it needed to be somewhere. Uh, so we just put it to signify that David was going to take back over for a couple of slides. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, Leif. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't remove that meme. And I mean, look at that. It's amazing. It's so All right. Good. It's so Security good. Uh, it's just too relevant. It's just too relevant. I don't even understand. Uh, I feel like it's probably sarcastic. Okay. So, you know, as part of this project, and like I said, we're trying to do this, you know, documentation portal. We're trying to actually create things that will help developers and will help pen testers. Um, although if they don't know how to code, that's going to be difficult no matter what. Um, but basically as sort of like a document that we can release to the world that'll actually bring some exposure to the project and will actually, you know, actually help out uh, some people quickly, um, we decided to put together an API security top 10. As I mentioned before, um, OWASP's really all about these top 10 lists. I don't know why. I feel like it could be a BuzzFeed article. But we decided to, you know, sort of just go with the schema and say, as all right. As long as it's not separate pages for each one, I think we're in. The we're going to write an API security listicle next. Um, this is a release candidate. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, we looked at the statistics that Leaf could put together from Bug Crowd. We looked at major high profile breaches that we could see in the media. And we said, okay, I think we can correlate these into what we find to be major pitfalls. Uh, you guys might have a different experience. We're more than happy. In fact, very much encourage people to give us feedback. If you say, hey, like, you're missing something or hey, this isn't, uh, accurate. We'd, we'd love to hear that. It'd be a little sad, but we'd love to hear that. <laughs> um, Okay, so like I said, this is based on sort of the aggregate data. Uh, we couldn't release the full data that we use from Bug Crowd because that's actually people's security findings. We don't know if they fixed them all, things along those lines. Um, but we're going to actually release the, the top 10 right after this talk. Uh, you guys will be able to download it, assuming I can find my laptop and Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Um, we'll probably hit the bar first. Um, okay. No meme shift. Yeah, we so, should have done that. <laughs> Just every poor, time. Poor decision. Just same meme. Um, <laughs> so uh, everybody who's familiar with the OS top 10 is familiar with things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, command injection. We decided to kind of just bundle all of these into a single category. Uh, injection has been the yeah. Injection has been the the top um, number one slot of the OS top 10. We thought you know it's getting a little bit too much traction on its own bring it down a couple notches and combine it with some of the other the other groups. And from an API perspective, a lot of these kind of fall under the same category of remediation or, or prevention. Um, it all boils down to improper data sanitization. Tables and shit, bro. <laughs> so the second one is insufficient access control. Uh, this occurs when API methods are not checked correctly for privileges. So in this example, there's a device manufacturer, and all it was checking was making sure that you were a user in the organization that was able to make configuration changes. So if I'm a user um, and David is a super admin, it didn't do any checking to make sure that I wasn't a super admin. I could do any of the changes that he did uh, just by having a valid set of credentials. So basically made the role-based access control for the device meaningless, considering you could have the lowest tier performing the highest actions. Another example of this is the Instagram hack. Um, it wasn't checking to make sure that the person deleting the comment was the person that had actually posted it. Um, so if I you know, posted a comment on some of David's Instagram photos that he didn't like, uh, he would be able to you know, delete them from, from his account. You might actually be able to do that anyway. That, I guess I could delete things that he had posted yeah. on his own photos. That's right. a better example yeah. and one that actually makes sense. Um, the next category is insecure direct ob object reference. Um, this is probably one of my favorite ones from doing web pen testing um, from the normal OWASP top 10. I will say that my favorite is actually C-Surf just because it seems so sneaky and it combines things with social engineering. I don't know why. I always just like C-Surf findings. But um, IDOR or insecure direct object reference um, is definitely an old favorite from, from the web app top 10. Um, this example was another device manufacturer um, and what would happen during the registration process is as part of a post request you would send along the device's serial number. Um, as part of that registration it would lock the device to my account so that nobody else could register it. Generally a good idea. 
The problem was is you could just iterate through and register as many devices to your account as possible, which would then lock out all of the other people that had actually bought that device. Um, so if we both bought the same little device, uh, I could just register David's and then he couldn't use it. Uh, okay, yep. Yeah. So this one uh, is similar, uh, or another one for insecure direct object reference. This comes from a company that um, companies will use to send out uh, questions to people. You've probably gotten one that's like, oh, hey, how happy were you with this product? Please rate it one to five. You know, maybe there's a section for comments or something like that. Um, as part of this, you could um, initiate a request that would allow you to gain access to anyone's responses. So whether or not they were in your organization, whether or not it was a, sur a survey that you had even sent out to your customers, um, you were able to access that information. So you could get uh, information about how happy somebody was with your competitors, assuming that they're using the same service and that you could iterate through um, and actually find their company. This next one, um, I believe, was part of the OWASP top 10 in 2010. Um, and then there's a similar category in the OWASP um, mobile application top 10, except they call it uh, insecure cryptography. I think IoT it too. and IoT. I think that also covers stuff that's on the devices too. Um, so it's a little bit more broad. But uh, without web browsers uh, spewing big errors, which they've gotten pretty good at, especially Chrome. Um, Chrome has been pretty aggressive with deprecating things like SHA-1, um, self-signed certificates, things like that. I mean, there's a ton of reasons now why um, companies at least have the little red um, marks through the HTTPS, if not a big old warning that, um, you know, freaks people out. We see frequently with APIs that people just aren't even adding the S in HTTPS. I mean, it's really that easy for a lot of these things. For whatever reason, maybe there was some problem that you had earlier, maybe there was like some certificate problems and whatever library you you were using for that was um, failing and not letting you wise. So as a developer, you're like, all right, well, let's just do HTTP and it works. So you just don't revisit it. We see, we see that a lot with uh, wrappers too. So if like mm -hmm. a public API is released, oftentimes, <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes, uh, like for example, someone will write like a gem to make it easily uh, accessible uh, or like some other sort of package and oftentimes even though the actual API documentation is saying hey you know this is an HTTPS call do this those same people that are releasing that API will not restrict non HTTPS requests and then you have the third party making this wrapper don't do it that uh, <laughs> I was watching that, Wild Wild West earlier that, so that would Jim act, West that would actually uh, make your implementation insecure even though the API itself is documenting itself correctly they've left they've left a hole open an example of this um, was there was the VTEC breach at the end of last year. Um, uh, for those unfamiliar, it was a, a toy manufacturer, and as part of the breach, there was uh, 5 million parents' names, addresses, other um, PII, as well as the, the names and birthdays of 200,000 children. So that definitely got a lot of press. It, it was unclear um, exactly where that breach came from. It, seem to be SQL injection, not related to um, transport layer security. The reason why I brought it up is because Troy Hunt did a little bit of extra digging into the security of um, their products and their websites and found that pretty much nothing was using uh, HTTPS for the web calls. So this is definitely something that's still a major problem. Even if it wasn't how that company got breached, it was a pretty big breach of last year. So um, we thought that it was worth mentioning as, as an example. Sensitive data exposure. Um, this occurs when APIs allow queries that are excessively broad. Um, a major uh, example of this would be social graph style APIs that seem to be particularly vulnerable. Um, an example of this would be uh, the grinder vulnerability from a couple of years ago. Um, basically, as an unauthenticated user, you could log into Grindr and say, show me the 50 closest people that are also signed up for Grindr. If those users had their location shared um, within the application, you could use a process called trilateration, which is basically you make that same request three times, and based off of your location changing and the new distance for those people, I guess you have to move around between the requests. But So you could move around a little bit, make the same request, and as long as that person 
was present for all of those requests and they didn't move, um, you could use that to get their exact location using uh, some of the math and geometry that, that's on the screen. That math. It would expose somebody's exact location. So, um, one, so this was a problem in countries that have uh, rather strict anti-gay laws. Um, you could use it to find not just kind of the general location of where somebody's at, but you could use it to pinpoint exactly. Or just stalk people. Yeah, I mean, stalking too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how he found me to work at Redspin. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> is it? <laughs> is it? <laughs> I think it was a referral. Yeah. <laughs> All right. As a side note, we also had a pretty long conversation about trilateration versus triangulation. <laughs> Different things. Uh, okay, so weak server-side security, um, pretty straightforward in terms of what that actually means. Um, it's similar to known issues or known vulnerabilities in third-party components, um, it basically occurs when the server itself or the API endpoint is vulnerable. So there's a lot of different ways that this can come to light and a lot of different ways that we've seen this happening in the real world. Um, for example, if you're opening ACLs on API endpoints, you might just say, yeah, whatever, just all traffic can go to this. We're just going to remove all security. And then your tax service will obviously increase. If you're allowing every service to be hit, you'll have the standard internet noise that everything open to the internet will see. Um, then there's also server-side vulnerabilities like Heart bleed, shell shock, image tragic. I chose the cool named ones because security. Um, but seriously, I mean, you know, we see things like, oh, we have this API endpoint. It's been running for five years. Uh, basically, sometimes people don't monitor it. Oftentimes, you see like ops teams that aren't really touching what they consider to be developer controlled API endpoints. Um, and then when something like heart bleed comes out um, or image tragic, if it's an image processing uh, API, uh, people don't necessarily patch it, and then you have vulnerable uh, systems just sitting on the internet. Uh, <laughs> improper key handling uh, is is kind of cool because it's unique to uh, <laughs> it's unique to to APIs. This is this is I gave Leaf credit for this image. This is pretty great. Um, improper key handling. Um, basically, it's API specific in that generally web applications aren't manually giving you keys to use, right? I mean, you could say, all right, well, there's cert pinning, sort of, um, HSTS, things like that, but really it's sort of API specific. Um, API keys, for those of you who may not have implemented an API, basically popular authentication mechanisms, but aren't, aren't always managed in a sane way. So like, if you're going to maybe say like have an HMAC for every request that you're making, okay, that's pretty secure. You're actually making sure that they have the key, they have a secret, everything's working. But a lot of times we see, okay, here's a 40 character alphanumeric string. This is your key. Don't lose it. This is all you need, right? Uh, the problem is it's not always say a 40 character random string. Um, we see things like uh, lack of key verification, meaning if you have the right schema and that it's say 40 characters, doesn't have special characters, they say, oh, this looks like a valid key. We're going to actually allow any requests from that, uh, which is pretty bad. Um, sequential or otherwise predictable keys, um, spoofable admin bits and keys, like having a secondary key where you're basically like, and I'm an admin. Um, keys and URLs, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so we have basically a really simple example for this. Um, this actually highlights two of those problems. If you're sending a GET request to an API, um, in this case, you're listing users and you have an API key, uh, first of all, this is would definitely be in the URL in the GET request, right? Because it's a GET. Um, and also, if your key is something like 1336, that's probably going to be sequential, right? A, it's only four characters or four digits. Uh, and B, I mean, it's a pretty low one at that. So a lot of organizations will say, yeah, just in increment that counter. They use the ID of, you know, the database row, uh, and that's how it works. Um, so clearly, if you have that, uh, you can very easily sort of brute force everyone else's just quickly run through 10,000 numbers, and all of a sudden you have access to everyone's account. Um, inconsistent API functionality is something that we alluded to uh, a little bit before um, and is generally pretty severe. Um, this basically occurs when API functions work fundamentally differently um, than those in the primary application. So a secondary team came in, wrote the API to basically say, hey, we're going to mimic all the functions. Um, but again, they're not spending maybe an 18-month dev cycle on creating like a really nice hardened application. They don't have the security team coming in and doing code review. They're just like, yeah, we can just open up these functions. It's fine. We'll just write to the database. Um, 
an example here would be, you know, in like a Facebook web app, uh, tagging should share the photo with the person who's tagged. Um, but sometimes like if you're tagged via API access, photos just shared with everyone, right? I mean, that's just not correctly mimicking the actual function that you're trying to implement via the API. Uh, just saying, yeah, this is pretty, pretty much doing what it's supposed to. Um, one of the really, uh, high profile examples of this would be uh, sort of rate limiting in the user interface versus the API. Uh, the most, the most well known probably being the Apple celebrity photo leak. Um, basically, uh, if you're logging into an iCloud account, you can do something like, I don't know, five attempts and then it slows you down or locks you out, something like that. Pretty standard to have in most applications. Um, but there was an API endpoint where you could basically just brute force that. It didn't have that same rate limiting in place for that particular API request. So then you can say, okay, I know whose email address I'm trying to get into. I can go through, you know, 10 million passwords and yeah, it'll take some time to send those requests, but there's no actual rate limiting. You can actually brute force someone's password that way. Um, it's unclear, I guess, as a side note, if that's exactly how that hack took place. But after it did, Apple patched that vulnerability. So maybe. Uh, security conf config misconfiguration. Yeah, I, I, I always hated this type of, <laughs> this type of a list, but we, as going through the bug crowd data and, and high profile data, uh, we realized that we sort of needed to have this kind of catch all, right? Um, other OWASP top 10 standards use it. It's basically saying that due to some sort of human error, whether that's how you're deploying it or a developer made just some horrific mistake, um, the API is not behaving the way that it should. It's not doing exactly what we expect, um, and it's causing problems. It's opening the attack servers. It's causing more vulnerabilities. Um, so this can either lead to flaws that we talked about before in the, in the rest of these lists, um, or just be kind of uniquely messed up. Um, there's, there's a plethora of weird examples for that, but they're hard to go over without disclosing who that, who they'd apply to. Okay. So we've gone through, um, you know, why API security is important. We've gone through uh, sort of our process, some examples there, and what we consider to be pretty much the top 10 uh, major risk categories when deploying an API, uh, and things that if you're a pen tester, you're probably going to want to look into. Um, now comes sort of the real, I don't want to say the point of the talk, uh, but it would be great if someone wanted to uh, to sort of help with us, because right now it's me and Leaf uh, in our spare time. Um, so today we're publishing uh, the first draft of the API Security Top 10. It's going to basically be uh, a nice, concise version of the slides that we have here um, in an easily readable PDF um, with short descriptions of what's going on. Uh, we'd really like to get feedback on what we've seen here. Um, you know, and if any researchers want to, you know, help us create more of these, that'd be great. Um, again, if if it's hey you've missed something, that would be great. Or if it's hey we don't agree with one of these findings, that would also be great. Um, but our goals, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, um, are really a lot broader than just saying, hey, we're going to make another top 10 document. It's really easy to uh, display that via the slides and to have a nice presentation where we go through the top 10. Um, but really, our goal here is to sort of make a documentation portal that can really help out uh, developers and, and pen testers. Uh, I sort of moved from the red team when I was CTO at Redspin uh, to, to the blue team and helping out developers. And it's, it's a little sad how little information there really is out there uh, that's like, hey, we can actually help you write something in a super secure way instead of just like, hey, we're going to teach everyone how to break it, which is admittedly much more fun. But, you know, we, we have to help the developers too. Um, so we're trying to basically make this portal to help devs write and deploy secure APIs. So we're looking for security researchers to expand on the risks here, to critique what we've already done. Uh, technical writers, you know, to basically create cheats cheat sheet style, um, you know, tutorials for developers. Uh, if we have any designers in the audience, I don't know if this is really the market for designers, but if we have any designers in the audience, uh, basically to help us accurately display our data, make it look pretty, um, or people, you know, sort of general evangelists, sort of help spread the research programs and recruit new talent to the project. Um, so you're probably th saying like, wow, that sounds great. I'm so excited. Like you guys are the best. This is the best presentation I've ever seen. Um, how can, how can I sign up? Right. Um, and, and, we, and we'd like, we'd like to tell you how to do that. Um, so you can find the alpha stage of our project at, uh, the OWASP wiki. Um, I'm not going to read out that whole URL, but OWASP API security project, you can search for it. Um, if you'd like to help, you can contact me directly via my OWASP email at, uh, david.shaw.owasp.org. And I just put these slides online. Uh, so for all the links and the research and things like that, um, they're available at dshaw.net slash nolacon underscore 2016 dot PDF. So 
thank you guys for being here. I know it's uh, Friday afternoon in New Orleans, so, you know, there's that. <laughs> um, any questions or concerns or anything like that? <laughs> How do we give away the booze? I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we could just drink it. <laughs> That's a good question, Leith. Um, no questions? Concerns? All right, cool. We took longer than expected. And, uh, yeah, it, please feel free to find us. We're going to be around all weekend. Happy to hang out with anyone or talk about API security or anything else. So thank you, guys. Yeah, we should get a picture in front of our first slides. Why?